What's going on, y'all? KM Best here with another episode of Eight Cubes. We have a guest host today. It is Binks Plays, and I think that brings us to our first topic, which is where Lambi. Now, Lambi, of course, my consistent co-host for this series, and that is not going to change. With all due respect to Binks, love you, but mm, sorry. Never Lambie say never, is, right? <laughs> Lambi is. I'm saying never in Taiwan right now doing a cast for a live tournament of Marvel Snap. He will not be home until well after the time we would normally be able to record this. Coincidentally, Binks messaged me approximately like a week ago. He messaged both of us like, hey, I'd really love to guest on an 8 Cubes. And it just seemed like sort of serendipitous time to say, hey, we don't actually have a Lambi this episode. So we brought on Binks. Binks, would you care to introduce yourself to anyone who is unaware of you as a player and you as a, you know, competitor, the winner of Conquerors after? I am the only official, oh, well, I guess not the only, but one of the only official uh, Marvel Snap official tournament winners. But yeah, my name yeah. is Binks Plays. Uh, I have been making content for Marvel Snap since the very first day of open beta. Um, I play different off-meta decks every single day. I mostly focus on ladder and do about a day at Conquest uh, every single month. And really, my goal is just to try and find ways to create new uh different innovative ways to still be somewhat competitive in marvel snap without just kind of uh, been like playing the the same deck every single day so i try and keep things super super fresh try and experiment a lot and try and do things a little bit different than other people and just have a lot of fun doing it two so two things one this is incredibly balanced by me who plays the same deck every single day and tries very very hard and two I just realized since I flipped your camera, your your sign that says Binks Plays is reversed, and it's very funny to me right now. Okay, so we have with us Simba Sial. Yes. It's like yeah, Sial Sial Zan. Anyway, that's our guest Sial for Zanin. today. Let's get into the rest of the show. First up on the show, or second up on the show, is of course Sebastian Shaw, a three cost four power card that has an incredibly unique piece of text on it, which is whenever it gains power, wherever it is, in your deck, in your hand, what have you, it gains two more power. So the first thing I thought of with this guy is you play this with Silver Surfer, it's oh, yeah. a 3-8. That's pretty good. You play it with Silver Surfer, it's a 3-8. Like every other free thinker in the world of Marvel Snap, they release a three-cost card, and I, a genius, see that you can play it with Silver Surfer. Uh, but actually, I do think there is a lot going for it in the Silver Surfer shell, because not only can you play it with Silver Surfer, of course, that's a deck that occasionally runs Nova Killmonger, it's a deck that can afford mm -hmm. running Nakia, and it's a deck that has some open two-cost slots, because if you're investing that Forge. heavily in green power, you get your Luke Cage in there as well. Now, I am a, as we all know, degenerate, like, what's the best thing I can do with this guy? Binx is not that... Do you have anything that you think I'm missing about Sebastian Shaw? I think you're right on the money. I think that he's such a natural fit in Surfer. Like, pro maybe arguably the most natural fit Surfer card that's ever been released. Outside of, like, I guess, Brood. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that you're right on the money. I think that it's really just going to find its place in a Surfer shell as just large stat stick. Kind of in the Maximus Gladiator type without with yeah. a little bit less of a drawback. Like... I think arguably higher ceiling too, which is kind of crazy in those decks. Like arguably it even has a higher ceiling than those cards, um, but like a lower floor because, you know, if you just hit the surfer, you just hit the killmonger, obviously it's going to be a little bit less than what uh, those three sevens that, that are naturally yeah. there will apply to you. Um, I think that a, a big card that you missed, I, I kind of said it too, is, is forge. I think forge goes Ooh, into a lot of surfer decks and forge true. is that's just a true. one five. If you hit it on, on Shaw. So like, Brood is kind of like the obviously super clutch hit that you can hit with Forge in that deck, but now you just have another card that's really, really good to take on that Forge hit. Maybe you can even start thinking about like throwing Nico in there for that, you, you know, the, the plus two and different things like that as different ways to buff. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it's just a very, very natural fit for 
a surfer so i think that in the best deck that it will be in it will be just kind of like a, a very very solid sarah nova surfer build uh, the deck that i'm really excited to play is just to go all in do a koye nakia forge <laughs> yeah. surfer nova killmonger just do everything and see how big you can get it obviously i don't think that that's going to be the best way to play it but i think yeah. you got it right on the head as far as like where that card is going to fit just a, a very very solid surfer card that might you, you know bump it up like ahead of one other deck which is really really exciting it's crazy how every time a three cost card comes out everyone is like ah it goes in surfer and then like it very rarely actually does like werewolf mm -hmm. not like it is kind of a surfer card but it requires like reworking the archetype entirely and it's definitely more of a different like it's more of a non-surfer card than it is a surfer card and this time it's like no 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 i'm charlie brown with the football all right it's a three drop it's a surfer card i'm playing it in surfer it's gonna work this time i swear yeah actually dude i underrated the hell out of wolf when he first came out because yeah. i kind of was like oh it's a surfer card but you have to cut brood and is that okay with surfer and then you just see out of these shrinky dink little bounce decks that are just yeah moving wolf like, oh, that's getting, a him, getting him enormous game. man um but uh yeah, I think that the fact that it's like pure upside in Surfer is really cool. There's very few cards that come out that are just pure upside Surfer cards, and and this is one of them. Uh, let me ask you this: Where do you think it could fit outside of Surfer? Because I see that, that's, that's why I wanted, I that's really why I wanted to ask you because like I am a one track mind. I'm only going to be like this is a Surfer card, right? The one other thing I thought of though, and I thought of it when you mentioned Forge and Nico, is like, mm -hmm. can this be a bounce card? Probably not, because Werewolf is just better at doing that. But if you have mm -hmm. like Forge, if you have Nico, if you have even maybe a Koye, is there value in that? Can you do that? I don't really know. I know High Evo Misty Knight will buff him, but I don't think that's a reliable thing because you're going to like play other cards too. Maybe that ends up being reliable. I, I don't exactly know again, but like I do think like Surfer and then like that fringe bit of me is like, ah, oh, maybe maybe we can get something going with like a bounce deck, but I doubt it'll be better than Wolf. So ugh. it's sort of awkward because yeah, a three cost card it's, comes it's out and you're weird. like, it's like, this has to be better than Wolf if I want to play it. And it's probably not going to be better than Wolf in that context. And it's like, ugh. Yeah, you're just, I feel like you have to add too many bad cards into any deck that yeah. fully relies on Shaw outside of Surfer. Because, like, once you go past just having Forge, uh, which is, like, a fine hit on Shaw, but that makes him a 3-6. Right. You probably, like, if there's a 3-6 in the game, you might start putting it in some just good card yeah. decks. But, you know, you kind of need, like, three ways to trigger him to feel good outside of Surfer because he's just, uh, like, naturally very good in Surfer. So if you don't have, like, three ways to trigger him... Because uh, if you get three ways to trigger him in your deck, you could probably trigger him two, twice pretty consistently, and that's very good. But like, if if you, it, but then you have to add three things, and like, you, yeah. <laughs> once you get past Forage, it's like I can add Nico, which hits him, yeah. you know, one in four games. So that's not really gonna add. I can add a Koye. Uh, like I'm adding a it Koye. It ends up getting deck. really already... awkward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Past Surfer and Forge, it's like, oh, these are a lot of cards that don't see play for a reason. But I'm really excited. I mean, I think that the Surfer's already kind of having a big revival with people playing like this Wolf Move Surfer yeah. that's been doing really, really cool surfer, things. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really cool things that are happening there. So uh, I think that this just, uh, Shaw's going to come out. It's going to uh, push a lot more Surfer decks and there will be some Surfer counter decks. And I think that it is going to be a card uh, that will very interestingly affect the meta. And I'm really, really excited for it. It doesn't seem broken or a card that anyone will hate, but it seems like a powerful and fun card. And that's... Kind of the creme de la creme of Marvel Snap cards. Any card that can that can be that, I love. You indicated to me that you wanted to talk about Boomer Snaps a little bit. So I just put it on there, sight unseen, so I wouldn't spoil myself. What do you want to know about Boomer Snaps? So I think that snapping and Marvel Snap, um, I, I truly believe it's the reason the game is so good. Um, anytime I play any other game now, I try and click the snap. You want to snap. Click the yes, snap yes. It's, it's unbelievable. It so happens weird, all the time. Dude. I played like Hearthstone Arena for the first time in like two years the other day, just because I was like kind of bored and new cards and stuff came out. And I was like, oh shit. I was like reaching around my thing. I'm like, you can't snap it. You just win or lose. Like, what are you doing? But like the, the I tried to like, snap in Warcraft Rumble. That's not even a card <laughs> game. So so I think it's this really interesting and dynamic thing. And I think that uh, there's been like shaming about snapping, and people kind of have this weird toxicity about when people snap at certain times and i feel like it's kind of gotten warped and construed over time so that people 
like don't really understand some of the elegant parts of snapping. So I just kind of wanted to throw some like situations sure. at you, ask you if you would snap in the situation, why, why not? And then just have. Okay. All right. So first example I want to give, let's say it's turn three and you're okay. against the destroy deck. Okay. You have priority. Mm -hmm. And your aim is to try and snipe where they're going to do their destroy stuff or drop their destroy stuff with either a Cosmo or an armor, let's say. And Shouldn't so it's I kind already of a... know that? Because they played like a Deadpool or whatever already? So let's say like on uh, one, they played uh, Deadpool. On two, they played Carnage. I know that's not obviously ideal, but let's say oh. like that's the situation. And maybe so what am I trying try to snipe the... though? They're trying to set the Deadpool again and you're trying to, trying to snipe where, where they're going to set it. Aren't I just supposed to try to play for priority there, and that way I can snipe it when it's down? Okay, so you'd say that they, your argument is that you just get ahead. Okay, so yeah. um, okay, that's fair. So let, let, just, just follow my example for a second okay. to, to, to get to where, <laughs> to where we're at. Okay. Sure, whatever. I'm I'm just trying to to, to clarify an example where there's kind of uh, indecisiveness as to what you'll play and where it will land. And if it does land, then you'll basically like be making like a very powerful game winning play. Uh, so for instance, in, in that thing, you know, you're sniping out a, uh, an armor or something like that, and then you land it. Uh, yeah. Neither of us have snapped. Do you snap in that situation after you land it and after you kind of like hit a very, very powerful play against them? Okay, so yes, I do. And the answer is, I don't think they're going to stick around anyway if, they're de if their deck is working. Uh, so the situation here, let's assume it's not Cosmo. Let's assume it's I'm hitting an armor on their Deadpool. And mm -hmm. I think I'm very favored from that point. Yeah, I'm going to snap it because either A, they're going to leave or and I'm going to get the same one that I would otherwise. Because if I think mm -hmm. the game is that over and it's especially against a deck like Destroy, where I basically know all 12 cards in your deck. There's no surprises. You're not going to Loki my stuff and catch me off guard. You're not going to generate anything. Yeah, I would snap that because I don't honestly believe that anyone would stay in that game when their deck isn't working. I think there's a little bit of a psychological aspect to that where it's like they're never staying on turn six. It's just not realistic. And so I'm just either going to force the game to end earlier so I can get into another one or I'll just move on there. Like it, I'll yeah. take my extra, I'll take my extra snap. And I think that, I think that most people generally like uh, agree with that, but that, that's always something that like, I I feel like I've had some, some people like really like push off against like, Oh, why are you snapping here? You're going to get them to retreat. And it's like, you know, it's so early in the game. And once you, I, I feel like almost to, to how I snap is that like, I think that, I think that there's two important situations where I snap in, uh, where I, um, feel like I have a surprise card that's going to take a huge advantage. So you snap before mm -hmm. that play, uh, something happens on the board. Like, let's say a turn three, like there's a flip of, uh, X mansion and like you get way more power on your side or something like that, or you get like a really significant advantage from that from that flip to that where you're clearly kind of in the driver's seat or you're like clearly dominating that lane. Something like that that happens where like a turn happens and you get a huge advantage. I think that snapping with that somewhere between even as early as turn one sometimes, so like turn one through five uh, in that situation, uh, or if you kind of have figured out that your opponent... Um, once you've figured out that your opponent is not doing their game plan, like they've yeah. kind of skipped a turn, they've played out a card for way less value than they want to play it out for, and you're in at least a solid position in a, you know, generally a pretty even matchup. Those are kind of my th three situations for snapping. I do feel yeah. like a lot of people... Um, I feel like there. I feel like in in specific, like I think snapping early. I think that's something that a lot of people have to work on is like when to snap early, especially when your opponent's playing a little bit worse, and being more okay with just snapping aggressively whenever you find an advantage. And I'm just, yeah. I guess I, I'm. No, I, I feel is like the, the weakest advantage part of my game. Important. Snapping is the weakest part of my game by a a significant margin. And one of the weakest things about it is that like, look, I'm streaming. I don't want to deal with like big emotional swings. That's elite. You got to mm -hmm. deal with it. Like it. Like that's me playing badly. I do play differently in Conquest. I have noticed it where it's like, like it, it's very clear that like when I am not regulating for streaming, I am a probably better player uh, in terms of snapping. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And um, yeah, no, I mean like it's, it's, it's super, it's super hard to retreat an eight cuber on stream knowing that it could be like, 
or to stay in an eight cuber on stream knowing that it could be like oh my god i just ruined the next two hours of my life trying to get this back <laughs> right it's so much harder to do that whereas mm -hmm. in conquest just like this is the correct thing to do you just do the play you, you think you're about 50 percent, you make the play um as far as your snapping scenarios i think you're basically right i do want to elucidate uh what boomer snapping actually is and what it refers to Generally, it is referred to as snapping well after the game is decided. Like, let's say you landed that Cosmo, and I, I do this a lot. Let's say you landed that Cosmo, but you're not snapping until turn five, and they're just like, all right, well, I, I stayed in it for free, right? Like, part of- yeah, you, part let of me, you let you me let work me, myself back. Yes, yes, you let me stay in this game. You shouldn't have let me limp around in this game. And, like, that's, that's sort of why you end up making that snap after the Cosmo in your example, which is- you don't want to let them stick around and limp their way back into an actual game. You want them to be smart and leave and get your free win. One topic that I wanted to discuss is that I feel as though mid-range, specifically Zabu, Darkhawk style mid-range, is back in a way that it previously was not. A lot of people, myself included, have been assuming like, all right, this is a deck that can't really match up with Loki very well. And I, I don't think it matches up very well with Loki, but it is very, very powerful on its own terms. And so it's very easily able to win those games where the Loki player doesn't have Loki or doesn't have Collector and isn't really doing anything and is sort of spinning their wheels. And the more consistent deck, which is the Dark Hawk Miss Marvel deck, will end up taking a lot of those wins out of that situation. And since Loki is such a known quantity, they it's very hard, as long as they just like, all right, well, the Loki player is snapping me. I know they have the stuff, so I'm just going to leave. As long as you avoid those, like, absolute nut draw situations, it feels like they're real games of Marvel Snap a lot of the time. And I just wanted to say that, like, this is a big development in the metagame, in my opinion, because I think that that whole sector of the metagame, the Dark Hawk, Miss Marvel stuff, I won't, it's not underexplored. It's very explored. But what the best version of it is, I feel like it changes almost day to day. Like, there are so many different builds in that space that it makes me feel like that is where the, the space that is the most ripe for exploration in the current metagame is. What I worry about, though, is that that's where it ends, which is to say, okay, we have this interesting thing happening in the metagame where Darkhawk midrange is back. How am I going to beat Darkhawk midrange? Oh, I'm going to go play, like, Brood Abs or move midrange. It's like, you're not going to do that because they lose to Loki. And I worry we, like, get stuck here is basically what I'm trying to get at. What do you think about, you know, the power of Miss Marvel, who I think is not necessarily single-handedly responsible. She uses both hands in order to do it, but she <laughs> she's a big, big reason why this deck is as good as it is right now. Yeah, four-cost Doctor Doom is pretty good. So, like, when that's hitting and it's not getting countered, I think that that's uh, obviously really insane, right? So, um, I, I really like the Darkhawk Miss Marvel decks. I like the... Um, I like the Devil Dinosaur takes on them where it's like really kind of point slamming and you're adding like different big cards. I think in your Twitter post talking about like best decks, you, you had a pretty yeah. good idea that there's either kind of the greedy point slam versions and the more super techie versions. Yeah. Um, and I think that those are really interesting because I think like the really teched out ones kind of like it's it, it almost feels like a bit of um, a gamble because like sometimes you don't draw the right tech card to beat your opponent and then you just don't have enough points to beat them and then sometimes you just blow someone out who is going to beat you because you have like multiple tech options to what they do uh, and it helps you in the mirror right like throwing rogue in that deck if you're facing another miss marvel darkhawk deck you have the rogue they don't you are going to destroy them right yep. so i really like the idea that it is very uh unexplored um and I and I feel like there is uh, a lot of things to do, but I but I I think the Loki problem has just kind of always been uh, ever since Loki has come out, it's just kind of been like you just kind of have to build your deck to die to Loki uh, or bit, like yeah. not, and, uh, you know, because yeah. like to build your deck properly, a lot of times it means getting murked by Loki, right? Like if you're throwing Rogue <laughs> again, if you're throwing yeah. Rogue in that Dark Hawk Miss Marvel deck. And they get the rogue, the rogue yeah, right? It's so, like, yes. so it's it, that that that's the problem that it, that it ends up coming to. It's it's building around Loki. So maybe you know Loki gets changed in the future, and uh, it's less of this absolute meta powerhouse. But I wouldn't say that the problem is on Miss Marvel and Darkhawk. I would say that the problem, as many problems in Marvel Snap in the last few months have come to, goes back to Loki, right? I have I tweeted a comment about like the the twelve five patch, like twelve five patch saved me, right? And mm -hmm. one of the one of the replies, this is just this is just the hardest shit I have 
ever <laughs> heard in my life, all right? Is four words. Need Loki die now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the greatest. It was so good. They cooked so hard. They distilled it down to its bare essentials. It was unbelievable. You know what I hope that they do? Oh, if no, they... we're, getting, we're getting off topic. Don't talk about Loki nerfs right now. We can't do it. No, 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 not about Loki specific. I said it's just in general. If they destroy Loki, like mm. make him unclayable garbage, I hope they're willing to bring him back uh, to or or try again to to bring him somewhere to in the make middle. To make him I feel functional, like that's... yeah. Yeah, to make him like still have kind of like the exciting plays that that Loki players are, are like really like to have, but uh, not put him uh, in the, at the point where he's again kind of warping the meta because it's so funny. Like you, you know, because uh, we're talking about mid ranger, kind of talking about how the how the meta always always uh, works and kind of moves things around. Even when Loki does get pushed out of like the it's so facto best deck, it still has such like a grip on how the meta yes. can move and such like a constraint that. Uh, I, I think that that's that's really the problem is uh, what is your favorite version of the Dark Hawk Miss Marvel deck? I would like to ask because I haven't I like played, Dara's. I haven't explored it nearly as much. I like the, the one that's really lot. all the Abs Man and the Mystique. The Abs uh, Man Doom stuff. thing. I actually I will say I saw Equinox doing that before I saw anyone else doing that, and I'm glad that like that tech has made it out of like that bubble because a lot of the times I will say Equinox is a player who has amazing ideas that tend to not get picked up on some of the time. And this is mm -hmm. one of those cases where I'm like, I'm really glad someone picked up on that and started doing the Invisible Woman Doom Abs Man stuff. I think it's very, very good. Uh, that's my favorite build of it currently. Next up is Blob, a card that I can't tell if it's good or not, but I know Binks is weirdly high on, so I need you to sell me on 6-4, but it eats all the cards in your deck and then gets all their power. So I need you to sell mm -hmm. me on that guy. How are you going to make him function? He's very large. Um, being able to slam down an enormous card uh, was never really something that was seen in Marvel Snap for a while. After, like, pre-release Destroyer Spectrum meta, because Destroyer was a 616, the game was way, like, slower and had less power and less crazy swinging things than it does now. And that's why Destroyer is a 615 now, because that deck actually got nerfed, because that Destroyer Spectrum thing was so powerful, you'd get into a position where you could just slam 16 power in a certain lane. Uh, now there's a lot of downside where you either have to have things armored in Professor X, you had to have the Cosmo down, otherwise you're, you risk blowing up your whole board. But that was so good to be able to just slam 16 points worth of power that it was totally fine. Uh, yeah. The next time that that came up was with High Evolutionary. Uh, so High Evolutionary Hulk, when it would just grow and grow and grow in your deck, you'd have this 620, 622 that you can just play without any other restriction other than having to plan your gameplay around it earlier, uh, just became this absolute powerhouse that felt nearly uh, ridiculous. You know, you'd be ahead in one lane by, by 17 points, and you'd be fighting for these other two lanes on the, the final turn, and your opponent just throws the biggest ball of stats somewhere that you've ever seen. Yeah. So I think that being able to... Um, play a monstrous pile of stats somewhere uh, is very, very, very strong just in general. Now, looking at kind of like the ways that Blob can actually hit those high levels of power, there's there's two different ways. Uh, there's ramping it out. So we have this wave or electro being able to play it early because then you can guarantee with Shava's in your deck that you're going to get at least nine added to it. So it's 613 plus three more cards, which... yeah. It's Big a lot number. of points, especially if you're playing a ramp deck. It's going to be a huge, huge number, right? So being able to ramp it up, now that obviously leaves it vulnerable to things like Shang-Chi or Shadow King, which is probably the scariest thing with the card, uh, in my opinion. Um... Or, you know, you just build a very, very big deck with things like Hella, uh, Hella Tribunal. Um... The reason that I'm just so, like, big, like, very excited about Blob is just to try and play it in ramp decks and just make multiple copies of very giant cards you know you can afford you might even be able to afford both taskmaster and zola in those decks uh but at least one of them i think that you can kind of fit into those decks to be able to copy its power in a ramp deck uh, so just la landing two giant cards and you know early on maybe you can try and find some ways to tech in things like uh, uh cosmo or armor to be able to like give yourself some level of leeway of like protecting are, those specific lanes are you just describing shuri but with more steps shuri but with more steps so how is it 
Because you need the ramp. More steps in the stream. You need the ramp in order to do the thing. You don't have your sour on backup plan. You're you're doing like a like a Taskmaster Zola type game plan. But I would argue mm. that both Shuri and Destroy are doing the Taskmaster Zola type game plan a little bit better. Because, for example, like they you do not need uh like an armor. You do not need an armor for your big guy in Shuri. You can make it a vision and move it around instead, right? Like, you do not need a Shuri even some of the time. You can just make a big guy, and it's Sauron Red Skull, and that's a big guy. Mm -hmm. And I worry that the fact that Shuri has this, like, comprehensive and well-put-together backup plan in the form of the Sauron stuff that is that is just going to sort of, like, make it so that, like, this blob high investment strategy is doing the same thing when it works... But on the downside of it, you end up in trouble. That would be that would be my worry. That's interesting. Uh, I could definitely see uh, some some problems with that. I could definitely see some pretty good comparisons. I think that um, you know, if you're looking at vision, that's 16 power, right? I mean, I, I think the blob gets way way bigger than that. You think so it gets I think way that, bigger. Like, What's he, what do you think the average blob yes. size is? I think if you're playing a ramp deck and you're playing the card on five, you're starting yeah. at 613, you're getting three random cards in your deck. I would say those cards probably have an average of between four and five power if you're playing a ramp deck with some other high it's like power cards. 25. You think you're getting like just straight up 25? Yeah, 25, 30. Yeah. I think if you're playing it in, in a ramp deck and, and uh, building it out correctly, yeah. I think you're getting red school, red suried red school power out of out of Bob right. and the decks and the decks that I'm kind of crafting him in, and I think that that's just I mean like, you know like vision. I feel like vision Shuri. The reason that you don't see it that much anymore is because like winning a lane with playing sixteen power on five and six like sometimes just isn't enough right now. It is uh, which definitely is kind of crazy. Kind of uh, when when like certain things are are specifically targeted, so like I think that it does have very clear comparisons to the Shuri Red School game plan, and maybe you're right in that Shuri Red School idea that uh, because you have to ramp into Blob and then you're kind of like cutting a draw out for doing that. Uh, now if that draws Chavez, do you really care? Uh, arguably not. Uh, but if you're like waving into Blob, then maybe that's way too big of an investment. And you're kind of putting all your all your eggs in one basket. Uh, but I'm just really, really excited to play around with the card. I feel like people, uh, and even even if you don't do that, in my opinion, there, there's still two really big things. Like, again, just having really big card. Even if you play it on six sometimes, if you, let's say, have a deck that averages four and five power per card, you're still getting, like, a 19 power play that you can just play on turn six. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, get destroyed, Darkhawk. Right. The Darkhawk thing is actually the number one question I get about this guy, which is, do you think Blob is going to get rid of Darkhawk, right? Like, is Blob going to get rid of Darkhawk? Is Blob going to get rid of Darkhawk? I don't think that it will, necessarily. I think it's weird, but, like, the strength of the Darkhawk deck is everywhere but Darkhawk, almost. Like, every other card in the Darkhawk deck is, like, kind of better than him, right? Like, you have him because you're doing this disruptive, you know, Black Widow-y, Korg thing. Like, obviously, you're playing him. He's pretty good. You're playing, like, you, yeah, that's like a 4-10, a 3-10. He just goes in there. But, like, you almost could get the same thing out of a lot of other cards that, like, with a lot of different conditions. The reason Darkhawk is the best of these fours is because the stuff that you use to fulfill his, like, side quest of putting cards in your opponent's deck, that's all also good, right? Mm -hmm. Preventing your opponent from drawing cards is all really, 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 really good. And there's no, like, card that synergizes with Iceman, say, the same way that Darkhawk does with Korg, right? Like, there's not another package you can run in there. So, like, yes, while it is good that you can make your opponent's Darkhawk zero, and that will probably win you some games, I just don't necessarily think that's the biggest problem facing a lot of these decks, right? Like, Darkhawk itself is almost ancillary to, like, the disruption and point strategy where you just go, like, you know, uh, Korg, Rock Slide, you drew a rock, I'm playing Miss Marvel, I'm playing Doctor Doom. It's like, I, would, would it make a ton of difference if they played an Iron Lad instead? Uh, played an Iron Lad instead of a uh, Darkhawk? A Darkhawk, yeah. Like, would it make a ton of difference? It could. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing with Blob is, especially if you're saving it till 5 or 6, uh, which usually you, you pretty much are, right? Like, um, they're, they're, they're not going to expect their Darkhawk to go from a 412 to a 4 0. Right, and I think that you're going to get some explosive wins sure. out of it. And I think that if you're playing Blob against a Darkhawk deck, unless they are expecting Blob and aren't are holding that Darkhawk, playing a four zero is bad. It is I, really I bad if they're not expecting it. <laughs> I will admit that. 
<laughs> Final Four Zero is. I mean, even you play Dark Hawk on four, and th or if you play Dark Hawk on on five, and they play Blob on five, and then they realize oh, I just played zero power, and they just played twenty. Uh, they're yeah, losing that, that game, right? So, so, so I think that it is the the fact that I think that it's already just going to be a big, powerful deck, and you just can blank Darkhawk decks out of nowhere is going to make it powerful enough, unless Darkhawk. It gets a pretty low meta share to make the card just really, really powerful and a lot better than other people are expecting. So, Binks is a creator who is known for experimentation, for finding weird stuff, ch making weird challenges to himself, and still not, like, absolutely dumpster tanking his rank. And I think that's actually something that's worth talking about because there are a lot of people who seem to be under the uh, belief that you can only climb or even stay where you are if you're trying super, super hard all the time. And while that may be true in the like highest levels of infinite, there's literally like, what, uh, only a thousand people ranked ahead of you right now? Like what, what, like, what are we talking? We're talking about like a 0 0.001 rather than like a 0 0.01, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, you're, there's clearly the ability to express play skill basically up the entire ladder and like no matter what you're playing. So I'm guessing, I guess my question would be like, as someone who plays, off meta rogue decks a lot what are your thoughts on how you need to leverage the element of surprise in your gameplay hmm that's a really interesting question um i don't think about the element of surprise so much with what i'm playing um i kind of play like a golden retriever a lot of times i just kind of look at like the three inches i in would front of i would have never like... guessed i would have never <laughs> <laughs> never guessed the man with the most golden retriever energy in the entire Marvel <laughs> Snap community. I would have never guessed. So I just, you know, I play with the six. I, I, I care about the six inches in front of my face. I just kind of, you, you know, make things, uh, make, make things I'm work. not, I, I, can you, you repeat that? I just wanted to hear you say that again. Uh, I just, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> I just work with the six and a half inches. You in care about the six inches see, in front see of how, your face? See how much it works. <laughs> I'm leaving this in. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think that people get so caught up on what deck do I have to play to be good at this game? Like, what is the best deck to get to infinite? What is the best deck? How do I get to infinite? What deck did you use to get to infinite? I'm sure you hear this a thousand times a day. I do. Uh, but I, I do think that just having really good fundamental skill in Marvel Snap and, and understanding your opponent's deck it's much, it's at least as much of an understanding of how your deck operates than, than not. I feel like where I can still be really good when playing uh, what some people will say is a deck full of a bunch of random garbage or a decks that, uh, you know, kind of have some good ideas, but like some things are just like really holding me back and then being very stubborn about it. Uh, it's just the fact that I've been playing this game since like May of last year. Yeah. Almost daily, right? And you, you kind of just get a very good feel for the flow of different locations, where you're ahead, um, and, and kind of like uh, uh, targeting like certain areas that uh, uh, takes a really, really long time uh, to, to just get down. I feel like people don't... People who just come from other card games, or even just people who are just really good at card games in general, like think that they can just come in Marvel Snap and just absolutely dominate. And there's been very, very few examples of people who've actually been able to do that. I feel like most people, it takes several months of playing Marvel Snap to really like understand it because it, it on its surface level, it's a very simple and straightforward game compared to other card games. But the fact that you're choosing between these three locations, you're limited to four spots per location. Uh, there's like a smaller card list. Uh, you have to get a lot of familiarity with these things and like pattern recognition, I think, to, to really be able to uh, focus. And then there's the snapping mechanic again, which is really, really important. Um, so Hold on. All this, this, I, I, oh, I want to disagree with something there, which yeah. is I think that the players from other card games absolutely can and do show up in here and dominate. Uh, Lambie is an example. I was a Magic player before this. I was a Hearthstone player before this. I was very good at both of those games without, like, fluffing myself up. I was pretty good. Sure. Uh, I've had Magic Pro friends that played this game anonymously and did incredibly well. Uh, I know Tanjo used to be, like, a Clash of Clans grinder. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I think that, like, there is definitely overlap in skills to a significant degree, and I think you'll see that a lot especially at the top end of ladder. Not to, like, immediately pick the game up and dominate it, but, like, the, the underlying principles of it i think are very similar to other card games especially if you have experience with something like poker 
like especially sure. something like poker is going to like make you very very good at understanding like the leverages of marvel snap and all of that like i think someone who has experience with poker watching my stream will be like this guy's not even good because i don't mm -hmm. leverage that enough like, like i said that's the weakest part of my game because i came from these other card games that's the strong part of my game is the gameplay the weak part is the snapping and they like they play into each other right but like that is uh like a weakness that i actively work to correct a lot of the time but i, I still think that like it will definitely give you a leg up if you're really good at card games before <laughs> like it'll probably help you a lot so i i that's a, i agree with you that's not what i'm saying i'm saying that i, I feel like i feel like it does take a, a while to get used to the pattern recognition of snap i think is what i'm saying now mm. I, if you have examples of people who are able to pick it up like immediately uh, maybe I'm just not as familiar with with some of these people, but like I mean, even like Lamy, you, you know, like Lamy came in and he was good, and then after like two or three months, he was like, oh, he's like crazy good because he I already think has. He was like, the... always that good. It's you just there was wasn't an opportunity. Sense? Yeah, I mean, I I was one of the people who like was watching Lamy back when he had like 30 viewers, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I he was exactly that good the whole time, <laughs> and it's just he just had an opportunity and a stage to show it. But like this guy is a former mm. Hearthstone Grandmaster. He's absolutely sure. he was that good. I I, I believe, yeah. I, I think I think that it the yeah you you can translate it very quickly. Lambie's kind of mm. like the perfect test case though, because not only was a former Hearthstone Grandmaster, he's also a guy who played poker. He's like the perfect guy to go over, right? He's yeah, the and, perfect and, guy. Yeah. So I will say like maybe, but I think that like based on what we've seen so far, I would expect. Uh, someone good at Hearthstone to come over here, I would expect it to be really, really, really good, really, really, really fast. Sure. Okay. Well, that, that's fair. I, I do think that there's a, a difference in, uh, like, when I play Hearthstone uh, versus, like, when I play Snap, I feel like there's, like, less relatable skills than, like, Hearthstone to Magic or something like that, right? Like, there, there's that's just, true. like, I feel, I feel like there's, like, pretty, pretty significant jumps in Marvel Snap's gameplay patterns uh, with the simultaneous right. turns and, and with, like, the very limited format. Uh, that I think that for the most part it does take a lot of people, but I mean I, I certainly think that a lot of things are transferable. And the poker, the po the poker thing is is something that's really interesting because the snap mechanic is something that I just had to think about like as numbers and statistically uh, to yeah. be able to like even understand anything. I try and like explain most things in statistics anyway with snapping. You know, oh, do I have twenty five plus percent chance of winning here? Let me might try and stay. like actually think about this. Yeah, <laughs> might as well stay. Like why why wouldn't I say why would I retreat here? You know, um, but uh, I do think it's that pattern recognition that uh, that is is what can kind of like set me apart from uh, a lot of uh, other people and just being able to like make these like kind of like wild reads sometimes that that just like takes me from like a no neither of us snapping like losing position to like you, you know almost all the time i'd be losing this game to like make a play that looks kind of stupid but like based on what they do just gives me like the edge to get over the top so i would say like in my opinion with experimenting and if you want to try and be good and, and play uh, more off meta decks it's using your focus on understanding what your opponent's doing and their pattern recognitions for sure let's talk about some of that pattern recognition skills uh, Eliath and professor x are cards that are complained about a lot and i think we both agree they're kind of complained about more than they deserve in terms of power level what is your theory as to what people aren't doing that they should be doing in order to beat these cards more so the, <laughs> this topic i think had six names as we were trying to figure out exactly like what to to talk mm -hmm. about together um which is kind of funny because we're trying to figure out like how to kind of like match these ideas of like why so many people have so many problems with professor x and Eliath, and um I think that there's a couple things with the the power level. I think that they're very tilting cards. So like yeah. getting crushed with them feels you feel helpless uh, a lot of the times. But the the biggest thing, the overarching part of this discussion, I want to have, uh, and I think that you agree with me 100% on it, is that 69%. people think 69% about yeah, give or take. Uh, people think that you start playing around Eliath on like turn six. You know, people who are kind of good maybe start playing around him on turn five. Uh, but I think you have to start playing around a life on, like, turn two or, like, turn three. Like, putting yourself into a position, like, it's like, <laughs> it's kind of like a meme. Like, you're like, 
oh, you know, I have no way of winning against Goliath on turn six. Like, my brother in Christ, you put yourself into that position on turn <laughs> six, you know? Like, like, you are the one who who played the game to get to that point to where you're, like, losing against Goliath. And it's one of those, like, kind of, like, long-term skills that it takes with Marvel Snap. But being able to put yourself into a position where the opponent can't just win by playing six power worth of cards and professor x and Eliath on turns five and six is how you're gonna gonna win these games by by stacking up your power appropriately on turns two three and four as opposed to trying to be reactive against it on turn five yeah i i think i mostly agree with you i think the counter argument i would offer though is is it good for a card to exist that if you don't play around it the entire game you're gonna lose to it is that a good thing especially if it's in such a harsh way right especially mm -hmm. and this gets like exaggerated when there's things like you know daredevil professor x and it's like okay well i couldn't even do anything about that i just had to like put myself in a situation where whatever their turn six follow-up is doesn't beat my ass right like it's there there there's like a very odd thing with Eliath where it's like yeah no a lot of people could be playing around this card a lot better should they be required to is i think a valid I think it's a very valid question. Um, my biggest thing on Eliath, and I, I do think that Eliath should be changed. I feel like I, I defend against people playing Eliath and say, like, A, you shouldn't talk crap about someone who's playing Eliath because I think that's just you silly do that and, about and ridiculous. Yeah, you shouldn't do that about anything, right? Oh, player plays good card. Like, all right, all right, dude. Um, Guy who the... only plays scissors <laughs> demands rock be nerfed. <laughs> like, it's... Stop it. The, the biggest thing, in my opinion, um, the, the problem with Eliath is that there's too many turn sixes that yep. are, I can beat everything, or I can beat Eliath, yes. I can't beat both. And Correct. that that is where the card feels like trash, when it's like, you play around Eliath, and then you lose to Chavez, or, you know, like, something <laughs> like that. So, that... That's that's the prop to me. That's that's the biggest problem with Eliath is that you run into these situations where it's I have to play around Eliath on this final turn, or I have to play around uh, the the rest of what my opponent could play. That that's my biggest gripe with the card, and why I think that the card should find some level of adjustment uh, away from the card text that's on it right now. I am tempted to uh, agree with that. Final topic, as always, a little bit of fun. This is going to be talking about what we think is the worst card in Marvel Snap. I want to hear your nominations. What do you think is the worst card in the entire game of Marvel Snap? Hey, and Best, do you like the card America Chavez? Do you think it makes a lot of decks better? I do. What if I told you you could have America Chavez's effect, except for instead of benefiting you, it hurts you? That would be bad. That would be bad. Quicksilver is the worst card in the game. I think that uh, <laughs> there is almost no deck that mids better by at, there. I I think there is no deck that's better by adding Quicksilver into it. I think you're always making it worse. There's no deck that would be better with Quicksilver than Misty Knight. And now there's some crazy arguments that you can make about certain Agatha builds or certain things like that where Quicksilver is okay. But I think Domino fits that spot a little bit better. Um, but I think that Quicksilver is just a huge detriment to any deck because of the percentages of draw. You're, you're lowering your percentage to draw every other card in your deck. You're saying when you're putting Quicksilver in your deck, the most important thing for me in the entire world is playing a 1-2 on turn 1, and that's terrible. So my nomination is that I think that Quicksilver is by far the worst card in Marvel Snap. Have you heard the story of why they developed Quicksilver? Uh, you know, I have, but some of the podcast listeners okay. might not have. So the reason they developed Quicksilver was because they wanted people to stop asking for mulligans in Marvel Snap. And I think that's just awesome. I think that is just the sickest. Like, that's so cool, right? Like, they were like, all right, you guys want mulligans so bad? Here's the worst card in the game. You can have that instead of a mulligan. Like, isn't that just the coolest thing of all time? I've got I've got <laughs> one other nomination, though, for you. Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got one other nomination. I know we talked about this, but I, I came up with a better one. My nomination for worst card in the game is Angel. Because Angel, Angel. is a card... <laughs> that you look at it and you can understand why it might be good. And you're like, okay, this is going to be sick. And then it is the worst thing of all time consistent. Like it is, it is, I remember distinctly people telling me that I was stupid for not playing angel in death wave back in the day. I remember this and I am holding a grudge and I am grinding that ax. Cause no, the card is terrible. 
It's not actual deck thinning if it only thins your deck like 20% of the time. That's not deck thinning. Just play Chavez. <laughs> like it's 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 so bad and it looks like it could be good and that's the frustrating thing about angel for me it's like it's a text box where when you look at it you're like i get Ooh. it this looks cool i'm into this it's deck thinning plus it gets a free dude and then like you all you draw him and you're just like i have absolutely ruined myself by doing this i have ruined my deck by putting this card in so why that's my nomination my, my nomination my nomination is angel uh second uh, honorary honorary by the way uatu the watcher uatu the watcher yeah Why honorary. Is, what's wrong with the watcher the watcher do you get to see the right location that's sick uh actually I, is, okay here's one do you think uatu is better than howard uh no because howard is ongoing and it's gonna yeah because you can synergy with spectrum yeah you can actually do something with that right but like that's that's sort of the range i have for uatu where it's just like boy that is like that is just it's a card that you it's like a trap it's like it's designed to trap you and like mm -hmm. that's what i don't like about them right like quicksilver is designed to make the transition from other card games easier that's fine i get what he's doing angel and uatu are designed to trick you they're designed to fool you and that's what i don't like about them. yeah uh, i mean to answer your question with howard i think if howard didn't have the ongoing keyword but i could probably make it so it doesn't and it would still somewhat make sense um, I I think that Owatu would it would maybe be better. I don't know. It's still like weird because like I still don't know. I mean, old Iwatu I think was dog water. Like when you had yeah. to have it in your hand, that was terrible, awful. Dude, Angel, Angel's kind of interesting because like it almost seems every time I play Angel, it almost seems statistically impossible. Not a few times it. I get yeah. I get <laughs> thin iron, and it's like it almost does it almost is impossible for me to to like understand why <laughs> it it does that you know. Um, well, okay, so like let's say you're doing decks. yeah, but like you're doing your destroy on like turn three usually, right? Which means your optimal situation is your coin flipping because you're mm -hmm. seeing sixty percent, fifty percent of your deck by turn three. So your best case scenario for Angel, that's most of the time when you're blowing stuff up, is turn three, you're coin flipping it. And if, God forbid, you get unlucky, then you're less than coin flipping it. Like, it's, it sucks. I, that, that card makes me sad because I really like what it does and I would like to play it, but instead of being able to play it, it's just very bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I still think Quicksilver is the worst because, like, Angel is just kind of base misty knight with a very slight upside whereas i, I honestly think quicksilver is downside you mentioned baron mordo as well when we were talking I about, did. Pre I talked which about baron mordo, yeah. shocker with a downside is what i like to call him Sick. which i think is just so funny it's like you draw you drew your opponent a card like it could have been dr <laughs> doom and then it's, you literally just gave them a card draw like as a joke yep like, that's terrible dude it's a bad card but i think i think the one drops that trick you are the ones that annoy me the most where it's just I like, like that idea because it's like not necessarily practice the worst, but like as to what it could do to you as a deck builder, it yes. just ruins you. Yep. All right, y'all. That's it for this episode of Eight Cubes. You can find Binks. Actually, Binks, where can they find you? YouTube and Twitch at Binks underscore plays everywhere. Come watch cool uh, deck highlights and different off meta decks every day. Yeah, do that thing that he said. Remember, like, and subscribe. Uh, I believe Lamby will be back in time for us to record his episode on his channel on Wednesday, going up maybe Thursday or Friday. I'm not exactly sure how his schedule works, but we should be able to record that. As always, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm McCann Best. I will see you in the next one.